Hi, my name is Arman, and today I wanted to talk about an introduction to console. So when we look at kind of traditional architectures for delivering an application, what we have is kind of the classic monolith, right? When we talk about the monolith, it's a single application that we're deploying, but typically has multiple discrete subcomponents. So as an example, suppose we're delivering the desktop banking application. It might have multiple subpieces where subsystem A is, let's say, they log into the system. Subsystem B might be showing the balance of our account. C might be wire transfer. D might be foreign currency. Now, even though these are independent functions, right, logging in versus showing our balance, we're delivering it and packaging our application as a single monolithic app. So we're deploying it as a single unit. Now, what we've seen over the last few years is a trend away from this, right? The challenge with this is, suppose there's a bug with our login system. We can't just patch that bug in this system and just change A. We have to coordinate with all of these groups and redeploy the application as a single unit. So to fix this, what we'd like to do is instead deploy them as discrete services, right? So this is what might be called a microservices or service-oriented architecture. Basically, we're taking the same monolithic application and taking all of these subcomponents and now delivering them as a discrete application. So now if there's a bug in A, let's say our login system, we can just patch and redeploy A without having to coordinate across these different systems. So what this really buys us is a, a set of development agility, right? We don't need to now coordinate our development efforts across many different groups. We can develop independently and then deploy at whatever cadence we want. So A might want to deploy on a weekly basis, while D might want to deploy on a quarterly basis. So this has great advantages for our development teams. The challenge is there's no such thing as a free lunch. So what we've gained in development efficiency, in many cases, introduces many operational challenges for us. So let's go through some of those. The first one, the most immediate, is discovery. Right? And what I mean by that is, let's say service A wants to call service B. The way you would traditionally do this is service B would expose a method, mark it as public, and then service A can just call it. Right? They're in the same application. It's just a function call. So when A is calling a function in B, this takes nanoseconds. We're doing an in-memory jump, and it's all in process. So we don't worry about you know, what happened to our data, how did the data get there, did we encrypt it. Right? It's an in-memory function call. All of that changes as we come into this distributed world. So now we have system A that wants to talk into system B. Well, where is system B? It's no longer running on the same machine. It's no longer part of the same application. And because we're going over a network, it's no longer nanoseconds. We can measure the latency impact in milliseconds between these nodes. So this first level problem is what we call discovery. right? How do these different pieces discover one another? So there's a few approaches to this. Historically, what we would have done is probably front every one of these services with a load balancer. So we put a load balancer in front of every service tier, and then we hard code the IP address of the load balancer. So A hard codes the IP of the load balancer, and then the load balancer deals with the fact that there might be multiple instances of B. So this allows A to skip discovery by hard coding this address, but it introduces a few different problems for us. Right? The first problem is, we now have a proliferation of load balancers. Here, it was sort of a different world. There was a limited number of applications, and we're packaging many different units of functionality as part of one app. So there was probably still a load balancer over here, but we had one load balancer now managing many different services, where here there's an explosion in the number of load balancers we have. So these are representing sort of additional cost that we didn't have. The second level challenge is we've introduced a single point of failure all over our infrastructure, right? And so even though we're running multiple instances of B for availability, A is hard coding our load balancer. So if we lose the load balancer, it doesn't matter that there's multiple instances of B. Effectively, that whole service has just gone offline. Right? The other challenge is we're adding real latency. Instead of A talking directly to B, A is talking to a load balancer, which is talking to B, and then the same path on the way back. So we're actually doubling the network latency involved with every hop. The final challenge is these things tend to be manually managed, the load balancers. So when I bring up a new instance of B, I file a ticket against the team that's managing the load balancer and wait days or weeks for that thing to get updated before traffic reaches my node. So all of these are a problem. So the way we think about it in console is how do we solve this by providing a central service registry? 
So instead of using load balancers, when these instances boot, they get registered as part of the central registry. So it gets populated in here. So we do a register. And now when A wants to discover and communicate with B, it queries the registry and says, where are all the upstream instances of this service? And now instead of going through a load balancer, service A can directly communicate with an instance of B. Now, if one of the instances of B dies or has you know, a health issue, the registry will pick that up and avoid returning that address to A. So we get that same ability of load balancers to route around failures without actually needing a load balancer. Similarly, if we have multiple instances of B, we can randomly send traffic to different instances and load level across all of them. So we get those same advantages of failure detection and load leveling across multiple instances without having to deploy these central load balancers. The other side of it is now we don't need these manually managed load balancers everywhere. So instead of having a proliferation of load balancers and then waiting days or weeks, the moment an instance boots up, it gets programmatically put into the registry, and it's available for discovery and traffic routing. So this helps simplify doing a service-oriented architecture at scale. The second big challenge we run into is configuration. So when we looked at the monolith, what we probably had was the giant XML file that configured the whole thing. The advantage of this was that all of our different subsystems, all of our components, had a consistent view of the configuration. As an example, suppose we wanted to put our application in maintenance mode. We wanted to prevent it from writing to the database so that we could do some upgrades in the background. We would change this configuration file, and then all of these subsystems would believe that we're in maintenance mode simultaneously. Now when we're in this world, we've sort of distributed our configuration problem. Right? Every one of these applications has a slightly different view of what our configuration is. right? And so now we have a challenge here, which is how do we think about configuration in our distributed environment? And so the way console thinks about this problem is instead of trying to define the configuration in many individual pieces distributed throughout our infrastructure, how do we capture it in a central key value store? So we define a key centrally that says, are we in maintenance mode? And then we use it to push it out to the edge and configure these things dynamically. So now we can change a key centrally from are we in maintenance mode false to true, and then push that out in real time to all of our services, giving them a consistent view. So moving away from having kind of the sharded distributed configuration everywhere to defining it and managing it centrally. Now the third challenge is when we looked at this classic monolithic architecture, we would divide our network traditionally into three different zones. So we'd have zone one, which was sort of our you know, wild demilitarized zone. So traffic coming in from the public internet. Then we have our application zone here, which was largely receiving traffic from the DMZ through a set of load balancers. And then we probably had sort of a data zone behind, the t behind us, or sort of a private zone. And only the load balancer could reach into the application zone, and only the application zone could reach into the data zone. So we had a pretty simple three-tier uh, zoning system that allowed us to segment our network traffic. Now as we look at this world, this pattern has changed dramatically. Right Now there's no longer kind of a single monolithic application within our zone, but many hundreds or thousands of unique services within this application zone. And the challenge is their traffic pattern is much more complicated now. Right, It's many of these services have a complicated east-west traffic flow. It's no longer sequentially from load balancer to application to database. Right, Traffic might come into either let's say our desktop banking app, our mobile banking app, or our, or our APIs. There might be multiple front doors, depending on the access pattern. And then these services communicate with each other in a complex east-west traffic flow. So this third level challenge now becomes, how do we think about segmenting this network? How do we partition which services are allowed to talk to which other services? So this third challenge becomes segmentation. And the way console deals with this is with the feature we call connect. And so again, centrally managing the definition around who can talk to who. And what this starts with is a few different components. First, we start with what we call a service graph. And with the service graph, we define at a service level who can communicate. So we might say A is able to talk to B. We might say C is allowed to talk to D. And what you'll notice is we're not talking about IP to IP. We're not saying IP1 can talk to IP2. We're talking about service A can talk to service B. 
The nice thing about expressing it at this layer is that the rule is scale independent. Right? And what I mean by that is if I have a rule that says my web server should be allowed to talk to my database, that might be expressed simply. Right? I can say web talks to database. But if I want to translate that to the equivalent firewall rules, well, if I have 50 web servers and I have five databases, that translates to 250 different firewall rules. Right? And so this is what I mean is that while this rule is scale independent, it doesn't matter if I have 1, 10, 50, or 1,000 web servers. It's the same rule. Firewall rules are the opposite. Right? They're very much scale dependent and tied to the management unit, which is an IP. So let's elevate that management up to this logical level where we don't really have to be tied to the actual scale. The next part of this is how do we assert identity? Right? And this comes from a certificate authority. So when we say service A can talk to service B, how do we know what is service A and what is service B? The approach Console Connect takes is to tie this back into a very well-known protocol, TLS. So we issue TLS certificates that basically uniquely identify these services. So we can uniquely say, this is service A and this is service B. Right? Unlike saying, there's an IP, and we don't actually know what's running at the IP with any strong guarantee. Now, how do we actually enforce this? This translates then into a set of proxies. So the way we end up implementing the access control is through mutual proxying. So on a box, we might have service A. And on that same box, we're running a proxy alongside of it. So this is sort of a sidecar proxy. And then similarly for service B, it's running on its own machine or its own container. And it also has a sidecar proxy. And now when A wants to communicate to B, it's transparently talking to this proxy, which is establishing communication on the other side to another proxy. That side terminates the connection and hands it off to B. And so this actually has a few different advantages. First, we're not modifying the code of A and B. They're both blissfully unaware that anything has changed. They're just communicating the way they normally do. The proxies, on the other hand, are using these certificate authorities. So the proxy on side A will use this certificate to say, I am A, and it'll verify the identity of B, and vice versa. The proxy on B's side will verify that it's talking to A. So now we get the strong sense of identity between the two sides. And this is being done with mutual TLS. The second advantage of using mutual TLS is now we establish an encrypted channel between them. This is becoming increasingly important as we talk about regulations like GDPR. So increasingly, our focus is on saying, you know what? We don't actually trust our own network within our, our data center. We can't just assume that by virtue of being on the network, things are trusted. And so as part of this shift, we're increasingly seeing a mandate to encrypt our data at rest, so things that we're writing to our databases or writing to our object stores, but also data in transit. So as data is going in between our web application and our database, is it being encrypted? right? Or is it as it's flowing in between different services in our data center, are we encrypting that traffic? The challenge is we probably have many hundreds or thousands of applications that exist and are not TLS aware. And so the advantage of imposing it at the proxy layer is now we can get that guarantee of our data being encrypted in transit without needing to re-implement all of these applications. Now, the third piece of this is just because A can prove it's talking to B and B can prove it's talking to A, that's not enough. Because it's not clear that should A even be allowed to talk to B. And this is where the service graph comes in. So then the proxies call back into the service graph and look for an arc like this. Is there a rule that allows service A to talk to service B? If so, then the proxies allow that traffic to take place, and A is allowed to talk directly to B. And they're none the wiser that this intermediate proxying is taking place. So as we come back now and talk about kind of this transition, right? what we really are trying to do is gain a set of developer efficiency by splitting our monolith and developing these services independently. Right? We want them to be able to develop and deploy and be managed independently. But we've inherited a set of operational challenges. right? And this goes back to our no free lunch. So as we came into this world, we now need to figure out how do we do service discovery? How do we configure in this sort of distributed setting? And how do we segment access so it's actually safe to operate this distributed infrastructure? These set of challenges collectively are what we really refer to as a service mesh. right? And so when we talk about console, what it's trying to do is provide this service mesh capability which underneath is three distinct pillars in service of allowing this microservice or service-oriented architecture to work. I hope that's been a helpful introduction to Console. There's a lot more detail on our website. Please check out our other resources. Thank you so much.